All right. Hi, everyone. So this week we are going to be talking about some different applications of waves, different types of waves, and we're going to start with sound waves in this little lecture. And then you guys are going to learn a little bit on your own about um, light waves and the electromagnetic spectrum and things like that. OK, um, so first and foremost, let's talk about sound waves. So last week we talked about what transverse versus longitudinal waves are. Remember, a transverse wave, we have the particles moving in a perpendicular direction to the propagation of the wave. So particles are moving up and down, wave is moving left to right. Um, in a longitudinal wave, on the other hand, the particles move in the same direction or parallel to the propagation of the wave. So I gave the example of like a slinky, um, which you can kind of see here last week. So those particles move back and forth as that wave goes by. Now, sound is a longitudinal wave. Um, this picture right here, this is called a tuning fork. I have a bunch of them in my, in my classroom and I usually let you guys play with them for a little while. So that's too bad that we're not there. But what happens here is you hit the tuning fork with a mallet or on the table or something like that, and those arms vibrate like this back and forth, okay? So as those arms are vibrating, what they're doing is they are pushing the air molecules, okay? So as the arms vibrate outward, and of course they don't vibrate this much, it's very, very tiny vibrations and it happens very, very fast, so you can't really see it happening with your naked eye. What you can do though is if you have a tuning fork, um, is you can hit it and then you can put it in some water and it will splash the water so you can see that it's actually moving. It's pretty cool. Anyway, <laughs> those arms vibrate back and forth like this. So when they push outward, they're creating compressions, which you can see in the middle figure right there, compressions in the air molecules. And then they put, they kind of come back inward like this, and then they create that rarefaction. So creating that longitudinal wave. So with this longitudinal wave, these sound waves that you hear, air is our medium. So remember, waves, really mechanical waves, not all waves, but mechanical waves need a medium to travel through. So air here is our medium. Now, of course, sound waves can travel through water, they can travel through solid materials as well, but air for the most part is our medium. And that's, it's filled with molecules. And those are the things that are getting compressed together and spread apart, creating those pres pressure differentials in the longitudinal wave. Now, areas of higher and low pressure, they hit your eardrum and they vibrate your eardrum at different frequencies. So when your eardrum vibrates at different frequencies, it then sends signals to your brain, which interprets those frequencies as pitch. So pitch itself, we kind of use it interchangeable, interchangeably, is that English? <laughs> um, with the word frequency, but it's actually not the same thing. What pitch is, it's, it's the sensation of frequency, all right? So what happens, the sound waves that you're hearing out of my voice through your computer, hit your eardrum, vibrate your eardrum, your eardrum then sends signals to your brain and interprets those frequencies that you're hearing as pitch. So interesting, right? Now, the human ear is capable of detecting sound waves from frequencies that range from 20 to 20,000 hertz. Of course, different types of animals can hear different frequencies. We know that those dog whistles, my dog's at my feet right now, <laughs> those dog whistles are really, really high frequencies, which a lot of humans can't hear. Um, as you get older, your eardrum can't vibrate as fast, so you're actually not going to be able to hear that high of frequencies. Um, and then we know, again, the sensation of a frequency is referred to as the pitch of a sound. So a higher frequency is a higher pitch, a lower frequency is a lower pitch. Now it's really hard to kind of draw longitudinal waves or sound waves, so a lot of the time we draw them as transverse waves, so the ones that go up and down like this. Um, and really we can think of this as what we call an oscilloscope reading. So an oscilloscope is a device that translates a sound wave frequency into a transverse wave reading. So it would look something like this. Um, so we see that the wave on the top has a lower frequency, it's less frequent, right? So that will be a lower pitched sound. The wave on the bottom has a higher frequency, it's a higher pitched sound. 
Now, the amplitude of that wave, the sound wave, is going to be equal to the volume of that sound wave. So is it quiet or is it loud? Now, amplitude is really hard to visualize on a longitudinal wave. Re longitudinal wave, really what it is, it's the difference between the compressions and the rarefactions, um, the, the difference in pressure. So again, it's really hard to draw. It's really hard to visualize. So again, we just kind of refer to those oscilloscope readings and just say, okay, the higher the amplitude, the louder the sound. So this is what they would look like. A quieter sound has a lower amplitude. A louder sound has a higher amplitude. All right, so now we're going to talk about some um, ways that sounds are made, so with different instruments. So with a string instrument, um, we can change the pitch of the sound that you hear uh, three different ways, okay? And my mom actually let me borrow her ukulele, so I'm going to be trying to kind of demonstrate this for you guys as well, okay? Um, so first and foremost, what you can do is you can move your fingers on the frets up here and press down on the strings. Now what that does is it actually changes the length of the string. Okay, so the first thing we can do is move our fingers to different frets on the string. So I'm gonna look at this first, um, the top string right here. When I pluck it, we hear one sound. And now I'm going to put my finger down in the middle uh, of this neck right here. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not a ukulele player. I don't know <laughs> how to refer to it, but it'll give me a higher pitched sound when the length of the string is shorter. Okay, so a shorter string has a higher frequency and therefore a higher pitch. Um, it's really easy to hear if I move my finger as I'm plucking. So you guys hear that? Okay, so shorter string, higher pitch. Um, another way that we can change the, diff the frequency of the note that's being played is we can tighten or loosen the tuning knobs at the top. So if I do that, here's the one that I was playing with. So I'm gonna twist this knob. So I'm tightening it and it's making a higher frequency, higher pitch sound. Okay, and then if I loosen it, going to a lower pitch sound, okay? So the tighter the string, the higher the frequency, the higher the pitch. Really what you're doing here, when you're changing the um, tension in the string, you're changing the medium, okay? Um, so because you're changing the medium, that, that transverse wave, so these strings are actually transverse waves, and then the sound that you hear is a longitudinal wave. I will talk about that in a second. Um, but when you change the medium, the tighter the tension, the higher the tension, um, you are going to be changing the velocity and the frequency and all that good stuff, and the wavelength too. You guys learned about that last week. Okay, and then last but not least, Another way to change the frequency is that the larger strings are gonna vibrate slower. So, and they're, the, therefore they will have lower frequencies. Um, now I have a large string right here, and that will have a lower frequency than that string right there. Um, on the video that I'm gonna show you guys next, it's really easy to see that, okay? Um, so let's show that video. All right, so someone put their iPhone into their guitar right here, and you can see the thicker strings are at the top, the thinner strings are at the bottom. So you can just see how the thinner strings are gonna have a higher frequency than the, the thicker strings, and therefore the thinner strings have a higher pitch than the, the thicker strings. Um, now another thing too, you can actually see the standing waves that are being made on the guitar strings. So since these are strings, they are going to be exhibiting transverse waves. Now those transverse waves then create a disturbance in the air molecules around the strings, which then creates a longitudinal wave, a sound wave that then comes to your ear, hits your eardrum, vibrates your eardrum, sends signals to your brain. All right, so those are, that's how sound waves work and that's how string instruments work. So let's just watch this for a little while. It's like kind of mesmerizing, it's very pretty. Isn't that 
vertical, you can actually see that the top string right there, that wavelength is longer. So the frequency is lower, right? The bottom string right there, the wavelength is shorter and the frequency is therefore higher. Um, very, very cool stuff. All right, let's talk about wind instruments. Okay, so there's some wind instruments right there. Um, now you can see that on the very far left right there, that's a piccolo. And then we have um, a recorder on the far right, but one in from the right, that's a bassoon. Now, I don't know if you guys know what a bassoon is. My husband actually played the bassoon, I think in like middle school or something like that. Um, but it's a very, very big instrument. So you can probably already think of how the size of these different winds instruments is going to correlate with the pitch that it plays. So the smaller ones actually play a higher pitch, a higher frequency sound. So the shorter or smaller the instrument, the higher the pitch, the lo longer or larger the instrument, the lower the pitch. So think of like a tuba. That's a huge wind instrument, right? So it's going to be a very low pitch. Same with the bassoon. It's much lower pitch than like a piccolo or a flute is. Um, now I have a demonstration for this as well. Um, I have two bottles of carbonated mineral water. I have Pellegrino and Topo Chico. You guys know that I love my like liquor and stuff. So I'm a connoisseur of uh, sparkling water, basically. Um, obviously the Pellegrino bottle is much bigger than the Topo Chico bottle, okay? So when we blow over the top of these, You can hear that the Pellegrino bottle has a much lower pitch than the Topo Chico bottle, right? Because it's a larger wind instrument. <laughs> um, now, another thing that I can do with this is if, if I take this, it's totally empty right now, but I'm actually going to add water to it, okay? So, again, let's listen to the pitch of this one. Okay, and then I'm going to add water into it. Let's hope I don't spill all over myself. So as I add water to this, what's happening is I'm actually decreasing the amount of air in the bottle that the sound wave has to kind of move and be in, okay? So there, I filled it up to there. So now let's listen to our, our new frequency, our pitch. Okay, you hear that? Much higher pitch than before. Okay, so what's happening here is we're actually creating standing waves with the longitudinal sound wave, creating standing waves in these bottles and in the musical instrument when you play a musical instrument. Very cool, right? I'm going to show you um, that on the next slide, okay? But again, I want to give you one more example, trombone. Trombone player can change the note or the pitch of the sound that they're making by changing the length of the arm. Now, I know that there actually are different ways that you can kind of blow into these instruments. Um, that changes pitch as well. It's not just as simple as changing the size or changing the length of the trombone arm. I know that, but um, that's it's beyond my pay grade. So, <laughs> But this is kind of a very simplified explanation. Um, now, like I said, in these wind instruments, in these bottles that I just showed you how they make different um, frequency sounds, the way that that's happening is it's creating a standing wave in the, the bottle. I want to show you this um, video right here. What's happening, this is called a Rubens tube. And a Rubens tube, um, <laughs> I wish I could do this in my classroom, but it seems kind of dangerous. They're, they poke holes at the top, all right? And then they run gas through the tube and they play different frequency sounds. Now, different frequency sounds then create standing waves within that tube, which you can actually see with the like open flame that's at the top. So what, let's watch this video really fast. The fifth experiment in the Cymatics music video is the Rubens Tube. So the Rubens Tube is my personal favorite experiment. Okay, just to tell us how it works. Okay, so we've got our propane. It's going to flow in here. There's a line of holes here. One end is blocked off, the other end has a piece of latex on it. And we're going to play a sound very loudly onto the latex. It's going to form standing waves of gas and it's going to come out the holes at different heights depending on the frequency of the waves. Plant. There you go. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's 
It's a nice, safe play. It looks like a graphic equalizer, just made out of fire, which is really visually exciting. It looks like a gothic organ or something like that. So a lot of the testing with the Rubens tube had to do with finding out. So you can see in this Rubens tube thing, let me see if I can, oh, I can't really, that thing keeps popping up, but the higher frequency sounds, you can see how that standing wave changes, right? You have a shorter wavelength when you have a higher frequency sound, okay? Um, so this is kind of a demonstration of what the standing waves look like when you have a tube like that. Um, now, in a tube, you, like I said, you can create standing waves. Um, this, of course, again, I wish that I continued to play piano when I was younger. I wish that I played a wind instrument because I would know more about this stuff. Um, but you can see the different types of standing waves that are created. This is, of course, a tube that's closed on one end. Um, they look a little bit different for a tube that's open on both ends. But what's happening here is just like you can create standing waves on a um, string, like I showed you guys last week. Um, you can also create standing waves in a tube with a longitudinal sound wave. Okay. And that's basically how we make sounds with a wind instrument as you have those standing waves within this, um, tube based on the size of the tube and, um, how the person is playing the instrument as well. All right. So that is like kind of sounds and in musical instruments, a very simplified version. Um, I think it's so interesting and it's so fun to talk about, but I could just learn about that stuff for hours, I feel like. Um, so I do want to talk about a couple different um, things that occur when we have sound waves that are pretty interesting. So the first one is called beats. And um, what happens here is that beats are alterations in loudness due to wave interference. So last week we talked about interference and constructive interference and destructive interference and what that is. Again, longitudinal waves, just like transverse waves, can also undergo wave interference. So when we have waves that have slightly different frequencies and the time between the constructive and destructive interference alternates, we then get this, what we call a beat frequency. So it looks something like this. You can see there's a red wave and a blue wave. Well, it's kind of hard to see, um, but one of those frequencies is just a tiny bit off from the other, okay? So right here, you can see that we have the blue wave is up, so we have a crest here, and it overlaps with a trough of the red wave. Now, of course, we are talking about longitudinal waves here. So this is just kind of a translation into a transverse wave. Really, this would be like a um, compression in the blue wave and a rarefaction in the red wave, okay? Um, so again, we have destructive interference right here. And then look, they line up here. So we have constructive interference. So we have a crest and a crest, a trough and a trough. Again, we have destructive interference right here and we have constructive interference right here. So when they overlap, we then get this frequency that we hear. It's like a third sound almost that you hear and it's called a beat frequency. Now you can see the blue and the red wave have both have very high frequencies. This beat frequency though, it's much lower. Do you see that? It's the dotted line. That would be our new frequency. Um, so you can see that here with the constructive interference, you have a very high, high amplitude, all right? And then destructive interference, you have no amplitude. Um, and then we can actually get, find the frequency of the beat frequency with this equation right here. I'm not going to make you guys do that at all. Um, so you don't have to write it down if you don't want to, but it would just be the difference between the two frequencies. All right. Um, I'm going to show you a short video that will actually demonstrate beat frequency. I do have these things in my classroom, so I usually demonstrate it for you, but So did you hear the woo, 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 maybe, hopefully? That was the beat frequency, okay? Um, if you did, if you rang these two tuning forks um, one at a time, you would not hear that like weird 
third frequency and the frequencies of the tuning forks would sound very, very similar. Um, but because they're a little bit off, you get that beat frequency when you play them together. All right, and last but not least, we're gonna talk about the Doppler effect. It's one of my favorite uh, things to talk about in this class. Um, so Doppler effect, you've probably heard it, um, heard this effect in real life. Um, if you watch Big Bang Theory, Sheldon was the Doppler effect for Halloween. Um, so what the Doppler effect is, is it is a increase or decrease in the frequency of sound, light, or other waves. So it doesn't just occur with sound waves. It also can occur with other types of waves, light waves, things like that. Um, as a source and observer move toward or away from each other. So this happens when we have a moving source and or a moving observer of the sound source. Now the effect causes a sudden change in pitch that's not noticeable in a passing siren as well as the redshift seen by astronomers. So the pitch change. If you can think about when a fire truck or a police truck car um, with their sirens blazing or an ambulance or something like that. Think about if you're standing on a street corner and it's coming toward you and then goes away from you. What does the siren sound like? Think about it for a second. It sounds high as it comes towards you. I'm sorry, my dog is barking. There's people going by. He's so fierce. Oh my goodness, you see him back there? Rowdy, shh. Oh okay, okay, that's enough. Okay. Um, so as it comes towards you, it's a higher pitch. As it moves away from you, it's a lower pitch. Okay? If Rowdy was barking and he ran toward me, it would be a higher pitch, and then away from me, it would be a lower pitch. <laughs> so this is our static or not moving sound source. Okay, we can see those sound waves, which are really just drawn as concentric circles, um, but the sound waves are just coming out from that source. <laughs> Will you take him out of here? Sure. I'm recording my okay. video. Yeah. Let's go. Come on. Go, buddy. Come on. Um, now, if that source <laughs> is moving, um, you see how those those sound waves are bunching up in the front, okay? So a sound wave comes out and then the object moves toward that sound wave that's coming out from it. Um, so you're bunching up as the object moves toward those sound waves and then behind the object where it's leaving, they're getting more, more and more spread apart, okay? So that's why when the ambulance comes toward you, you hear a higher frequency sound. When it goes away from you, you hear a lower frequency sound. All right, and I'm actually going to show you an example. Um, so here's an example of the Doppler shift using a car horn. Isn't that cool? So as the car came toward you, it was a high sound, and then as it moved away, it kind of, the pitch decreased to a lower pitch sound, a lower frequency sound. That, that's a Doppler effect. Um, and then, like I said in the last slide too, you can actually, astronomers use this Doppler effect, um, and if you've heard of something called a redshift or a blue shift, they can see if stars are moved, how fast, really, stars are moving away from us, because um, if something is moving away, again, we get a lower frequency, just like when the car passed us and it was blaring its horn, you get a lower frequency sound as the car is moving away from you. Um, so if the star is moving away, it's a lower frequency um, of light, okay? And the visible spectrum, the lowest frequency that we can see is the red, the frequency of the red light waves. Um, and I wore this shirt just for this lecture says this shirt is blue if you run fast enough. So obviously it's a red shirt. If I ran toward you fast enough, um, the Doppler effect would make the frequency that's coming from my shirt decrease and blue and violet are like the smallest frequencies. So that's red shift and blue shift. Okay. <laughs> so I hope that you guys learned something today. This kind of stuff is some of my favorite stuff to talk about just because I think it's so interesting, the applications that we see in our everyday lives. I'm sorry for my barking dog. 
this is the second to last week of this whole year and it has been interesting that's for sure um i hope all is well with you guys i will see you soon